Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Ziggy Marley and Malcolm Gladwell to our series. We invite you to visit our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations much like this. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle and all is Live Talks LA. Ziggy Marley's new book is Bob Marley, Portrait of a Legend, a beautiful coffee table book from Rizzoli. Ziggy is an eight-time Grammy winner, an Emmy winner, an author, philanthropist, and a reggae icon. He has released 13 albums, all to much critical acclaim. Malcolm is the author of six New York Times bestsellers, The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers, What the Dog Saw, David and Goliath, and Talking to Strangers. He is also the co-founder of Pushkin Industries, an audio content company that produces the podcast Revisionist History and Broken Record. I am Ted Haptegaber, founder and producer of the series, and towards the end, I will pose some of the great questions you and the audience sent in. I'll let you take it from here, Malcolm. Good. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ziggy. Thanks for joining. Yes, yeah, Thank joining me today. Um, yeah. I would say I was look. You know, your this book that you've done um, with all of these photos of your father. It was. It had a kind of personal resonance for me because, as you may know, my Mom is Jamaican. And when I was growing up in the 70s, we would go to Jamaica every year, every Christmas. And all these, so many of these photos are from the Jamaica that I remember as a kid. It's funny. It's like, I mean, it's very personal for you, but in this weird, indirect way, it's personal for me too. Just, I, brought, I was looking at some of these photos and I could, you know how when you look at a photo of Jamaica, you can smell Jamaica? <laughs> yeah. I could I could smell I could smell Jamaica again. It's this lovely like took me back to my childhood. Um tell me why you what to, what led you to want to do this book? Well, um over the years the family, you know, and I, um I I curated the book, but it's really the family's book, you know. It's all mm -hmm. of us um have um some stake in this book, you know, is a, is a family. So over the years, we've we've collected a lot of photographs of Bob um, from different photographers and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, usually I think the photographs you see of Bob are iconic photographs, you know, you always see the iconic images. And so for this, for this book, um, we came up on the 75th birthday anniversary and I felt like let's do something special for the 75th. Let's take some of these photos we have in our archives and put together a photo book. Um, the family has never done one before. Other people have done one. All the other photographers have their photo books. Mm -hmm. But the family have never really done a photo book of Bob um, before. So we, had, we have so many pictures. It's too many, too many pictures. And I totally understand what you said when you talk about you smell Jamaica, the photos, because Doing the book, it, like it brought me back to that time too. You know, when I'm mm -hmm. looking at it, just it's like it's such a, it's such a real experience, a real thing, that when I was looking at the photos, it you know, it everything just kind of came back to me. Um, so this was to celebrate the 75th, and we thought we'd do something special, and so we came up with this. Yeah, when you say, I was just thinking logistically. You said this is really the family's book. There's so many of you. How on earth did you guys did you guys coordinate picking all of these photos? Did you have like a family council where you all sat down and went through them? <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I was given the task. I was oh, given I that responsibility of going through the photos. That's what we do. We kind of delegate responsibilities. Yeah. You know, so everybody, yeah. hey, all right, this is your project. You have you have the family's approval and blessing. It's your project. Go ahead and do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. He um well, tell me about your your memories of your father you so you're born in 68 so you yeah. when he dies you're you're just a teenager yeah is so it, I'm going on 13 yeah yeah tell me tell me a little bit about what you remember of your father um for well everything i mean there's nothing to forget really because the, the limited experience we, we've had with him you know everything was memorable and left a, a um a everlasting impact on my psyche you know what I say? Mm -hmm. Everything, it was like going to school, but a different type of school. You know what I say? It's like, so growing up with Bob, I mean, there was, there was different elements. It was the fun side, happy side, you know, play around with children. We would travel to the countryside, his hometown, um, every now and again. Um, and it's funny, I remember those days there were no seat belts. He would have me in a lap in the front seat, 
no seat belt, no 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 airbag, no nothing. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe me, I remember that. I remember, remember being stuffed in the Jamaica in the back of a Volkswagen Beetle, driven by my yeah. uncle. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my my mom had one of those too. She had one of those Beetles too. Yeah, yeah. So um, but I mean, and then there was a serious side. It was the what I saw was a lot of discipline. This man I love work hard. This man I love discipline. This man I, he's from the countryside. And him, 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 he's so root, rooted in his humility that for him to come back to his hometown or go back to Trench Town in the ghetto, it was like it's just a, it's just Bob. This is just Bob. It's not like Bob the the superstar or Bob the whatever. You know, it's just Bob. So I mean, lot, lots of soccer, lots of football, soccer music, soccer music. And the spiritual side of it was a very powerful thing. Um, Bob always loved having Bible. And he would take me and my brother Stephen to these, um, what you call them? It's like service. Like, you know, people go to church service or mm -hmm. people go to the synagogue or the mosque. Well, we had these things called Naya Bingis. And we would, it would be like some weird time of the night. And it was such a mystical, that's why I say it left such an impression on me as a child. Because it was such a, the, the Naya Bingis was such a mystical thing. You know, smoke, fire, drums singing chanting and a whole spiritual vibe you know so yeah you know we grew up in that kind of environment where every memory really is stuck with us and the memory is stuck with us more than just a memory it's stuck with us as like an experience that has kind of molded us into who we are today you know mm -hmm. so it's a, it's, a, it's a real heavy thing you know it's heavy yeah tell me the other part of it that's fascinating to me as i said earlier was um Jama the jamaica of that period which is jamaica in the 70s so many of these photos are about jamaica in the 70s and jamaica in the 70s is a an intense place it's a i mean politics is manly and siaga and there's violence and there's gun court and there's <laughs> reggae and there's you know <laughs> Don Quarry winning gold medal. I mean, it's just sort of like there's so I remember go there as a kid. It's just like so much I was coming from rural Canada where nothing happened to a place where everything was happening. Talk, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you were in the epicenter of this because yeah. your father was at the was the kind of in the middle of the of the maelstrom. Yeah, there were certain mileposts that I can like remember about the seventies, especially the uh, the more um, turbulent times the politics so we can go back i remember um the night my parents were shot right mm -hmm. i remember before my mother left to go to rehearsals i was like yo mommy take me to rehearsals i wanted to go i wanted to go to rehearsals she said no like you have school tomorrow and i was like very like angry that she never let me go to rehearsals and then you know looking back after you, the, the shoot i think she, she probably was, it was a good decision right so i remember that night i remember she leaving and um, we went to bed, right? But in the middle of the night, some police came to the house and like grabbed us up and like, there was a lot of, you know, like chaos and like, let's go, Moodle. let's go, let's go, get the kids them out of the house. And they drove us to wherever we were going. We never know, I was just like this. I was like, what the fuck is going what year? This like, is what year? <laughs> what is 70, 76? What year Bob gets the assassination attempt? 76, yeah. Yeah. So, that experience going up there and then another um another more impactful experience was with my mom actually because we're talking about the 70s and what was going on there the political upheaval and just you know the, the drama everything so my so my mother picked us up from school this was during the height of the the, the um there was a big protest going on political they were blocking the roads fire burning tires burning in the streets so my mom picked us up from school in in the Beetle, in the VW. Mm -hmm. She's driving us home. And um she, she we, we come up on a roadblock. We can't we can't get home. We're both, we're not too far from home, but we can't pass because these guys there, there's tires burning and these guys are like and I remember being in the back seat and watching my mother. She came out of the car and she confronted these guys in a very brave. She's brave. I mean it, it's brave what she did. She like Stand up and say, yo, not for, you know, whatever. I, she curse her, do what she have to do. And she talked them down and they kind of like, okay. And kind of mm -hmm. part, the, part the road back and we drove through. So that's a, that's another memory that's like, from, from remember that time and the, the turbulent political situation 
those two mile posts is what I go back to um, for that. But I mean, there was good times too, man. You know, I mean, I mean, going back to Trenchtown, playing football. You know, it, it was it was it was a very double edged sword that period of time because it was so good too. The, the yeah. vibe, the energy, yeah. the music. There was so much life, and there was so much revolutionary like change. You know, like. It's the same time Bob and Claude Massop, who was a, um, I would say a, a strong man or a strong arm for the, the a political faction and Bucky Marshall. They came together and were starting to kind of disown the politics. And I was there too. I met I met all of these guys. Take Live, and I knew I knew what was happening. Um, and I, and I kind of, but actually when I got later on, I kind of understand who these guys were because I just saw them as guys, as Bob's friends. Yeah. And I know they were meeting and talking and blah, blah, blah. But when I grew old, I realized these guys were some dangerous men. They weren't just like some laugh. These guys were some serious guys, you know? So that is, yeah, that is the world. That is the world, you know, back in the mm -hmm. 70s. I remember, yeah. it's funny, you talk about your mother in that roadblock. My grandfather telling me that he'd be driving down the road and there'd be a roadblock. And he got really good at guessing whether it was JLP or PNP, the two, <laughs> two parties. Yeah. So he'd... he'd Take a look. He'd say, "Oh no, that's JLP." And <laughs> wave his fist out the window. JLP. They're like, yeah, wave yeah, him through. Yeah, yeah. Right. Next one would be PNP. <laughs> wave him through. Smart, smart. Smart. <laughs> but, um, but that, you know, to your to your point, it's the world that birthed this extraordinary amount of your father's music. I mean, it's yeah. what gave his music such immediacy and um, urgency and power, right? I mean, it grew out of. Do you remember him? How, did your father talk a lot about the kind of the politics of Jamaica? Was that something that was a? Not, I mean, not to me. I mean, I've heard, I've overheard stuff, and I've, you know, but never directed to us. Um, yeah. No, but I mean, he's spoken about it. Um, obviously, he's not. He's not a political person to say. Well, him, him decide this politics or that political party or whatever. Um, I think he was a threat because his thing was Rastafari, which is another thing. So mm -hmm. it's neither PNP or GLP. It's like its own things. Yeah. And what was happening was that all of the I mentioned Claude Massa, Bucky Marshall, these were the, the strong arms. These were these were the the um the enforcers of the political parties, the lead enforcers. These guys were coming over to Bob's side. So there was a whole other thing going on that the political powers were losing their their their, their muscle. To this other idea of Rastafari, and that was what Bob was really about. Really, if, if it, I mean, if it, if he was about politics, it was the political party of Rastafari, mm -hmm. which is a spiritual movement. You know, we want to change, change how things are. So, I think that was his politics. Rastafari was his politics. We could say, you know. Yeah, I was trying to think whether there's another musical artist who has had the same kind of status in his or her home country as. As as your father did, I mean, I'm remembering that famous concert where the two political figures of the day, Siaga and Manley, mm -hmm. didn't they shake hands on stage at a at a Bob Marley concert? Yeah, the One Love Peace concert. The one Love Reluctant, Peace concert. Reluctantly. Yeah, <laughs> but it would be as if, I mean, the, the analogy would be as if Donald Trump and and Joe Biden had kind of hugged on stage at a Bruce Springsteen concert, right? That's the, that's the close, I mean, but it doesn't even, that doesn't even capture it. I mean, it's an odd, because I, I wonder whether today people have, you know, they remember the music, but they they don't know about, this is why I love the, the book so much, because it takes us back to the the time and the place, yeah. um, which was this strange, wonderful era. But uh, can you think of a, a musical, I mean, there are some, a, a, a musical figure who was analogous to your father? No, yeah, kind of I, I think about um, Fela Kuti mm -hmm. from Nigeria. Yeah. And him, he was, you know, he was another one of my, I met him once um, in Chicago, but he was, he was serious. He was real, you know, I mean, what he did in, in Nigeria, standing up against the government, the brutality and the songs he wrote about. That really, he, he uh, just like my father, assassination attempt, I mean, they would raid him and beat him and beat his mother and, you know, all type of things. So, Fela Kuti would be a, a, a good analogy to Bob, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there are a couple, maybe a couple of South African 
Um, he must mm-hmm. have maybe mm-hmm. would be a, a good analogy. But um, when when do you become aware that you want to make your life in music? Is that something that comes to you very young and looking at your father or afterwards, after his death? No, it come, it come before that. I mean, the first concert we played was a concert that um, Bob was on. It was mm-hmm. the, the International Year of the Children. What a year that was, though. 79. Um, so he, and he wrote the first song that we ever sung. Yeah. So we was always in music and Bob would always call us to sing when he's writing it. Hey, you know, come sing. Yeah, we play and we want to go play. He's t- telling us to come sing. You know what I'm saying? So we started very young with music. Um, the, the thing I get from Bob, musically speaking, is the discipline and, and the focus and the, the seriousness in which you approach the music, um, the respect that you give the music. So you have to put in the work that shows you respect the music. It's not like mm-hmm. you just play it and, you know, you have to sing the right, you know, you have to practice, you know. So really when we, we used to sit at rehearsals and watch Bob them rehearse, and I think for some reason I grew up taking that that ethic of hard work and, and, and putting it into my own music and my life in general, you know, whether it be exercising or whatever, I think seeing him just, you know, grind and like want to make it right and the discipline, the discipline, you know what I say? The discipline is, is really, yeah. is, a, is a strong impact on me seeing that discipline as, a, as growing up around that. Can you talk a little bit about the way he made music? I mean, was there, was there a kind of a, an approach that, a particular approach? And can you, can you give, I'd love us of an example of, 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 of how he worked and how he created. Well, what I saw, so what I saw, cause, um, and this was probably um, in Miami at his mother's house, yeah. Um, but he always had his guitar around and a lot of time it's mumbling. You don't really, it's not a song. You just hear ideas coming out. Um, and for me, he would always have fun with it. It was never like a serious, like, writing and you know it, it was always like something very joyful in the process it was very joyful and happy and people around and laughing and you know you getting lyrics making fun um there, there's this one and i don't think he ever did release this one it was released it's kind of like a, he did it as a demo real it's called like a real good time and i don't, I don't remember him being in miami in his bedroom with his ovation guitar and he was just having fun with it, we're having a real good time. You know, and people, you know, they must smoke, them spliff, and it's just a good energy, just a good vibe. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. it's a really, and then you, and then I, you never hear when the song complete. You only hear when it come on the record. You hear pieces of it, ideas of things, you know, and then you hear a record. So you never really, I never really hear him complete one song, writing a song completely. You know, you always hear little bits and pieces here and there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When he, when your father became ill, a lot of his um, best work is obviously his, 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 his latest work, his very, very last work. You know, I'm just wondering whether was there a sense of urgency with him when he, when he became ill to sort of uh, to to did his did his work take on a, a a new kind of seriousness in that? But he was always urgent from him. Yeah. I mean, he was urgent from the get go. Cause, so, and it, there are a few examples of that kind of energy of his urgency, of his um, work ethic, of his determination. So he was in the band the Wailers with with Bonnie and Peter, these three guys, right? They were in this band, and um, obviously it never worked out because, according to what he said in an interview, it was like, and him said these words. He used my name. He says. If him, if you think when Ziggy wants to go to school that he can say blah blah him, he didn't want to work he didn't want to do this what you know so this is he wants to work you know he he, he wants to get things done there was always an urgency there was never a, a lag time there was never a lag time there was always music there was never any like all right let me take a vacation now all right let me go chill out now there's no it was like. 36, I mean, how much years, 36 years of like pushing, you know, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, touring, never stopping. 
So that urgency of feel was always there. Mm -hmm. What's of, of all of his music? What is the what are the songs that speak to you the most? Do you have some songs that you come back to that? Yeah, not really, not really, not really. I mean, the song that gets me the most is a redemption song because mm -hmm. I remember short after him passed that was the album that was this album that song was was the emotional um spear the emotional arrow you know it, when you hear that song at that in that time it so that memory of that song are related to that time period and it was it's him and his guitar it's so it's so soulful and just like you know uh, uh, the the final the thing is just him and him guitar and so that song always kind of have an emotional um, impact on me. Yeah, yeah. T tell me a little bit about your, I want to know more about your childhood. There's a lot of moving around. Mm. There's London for a bit. There's trips, sounds like lots of trips to America. There's yeah. Jamaica. There's yeah. where, where does your, I mean, will you tell me a little bit about what that was like? Were you, how many, how long did you spend in Jamaica before you, so you went to you, your family went to London right after the shooting. Is that right? You yeah, know. but we 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 never got London. Um, we so all right. So Trenchtown, right? Trenchtown. Where, where I, I was born in Trenchtown. Mm -hmm. Grew up in a Trenchtown a little bit, and then moved to Delaware, where his mother had moved, had migrated to. So we lived yeah. in Delaware, Wilmington, Delaware. I went to school, elementary school in Delaware for maybe a year or so. Then we moved back to Jamaica. But we move out of Trenchtown and move into a place called Bull Bay, which is a much better standard of living. It's like, you know, look, not poor, but not rich. It's like the middle, like middle mm -hmm. class or something like that mm -hmm. in Jamaica at the time. But it's funny, within that middle class community, when our mother lived, we would stay with our grand aunt. And it was like we had to walk up the road and up the hill. And she was living in a poor, a, a poor class house with no water, no toilet, no nothing. So right within that middle class thing, there's right. If I went to my aunt house, it was like I was in another neighborhood. And so we would stay with her a lot of times um, because mommy and daddy would go on tour and then we would have to stay with grandma auntie mm -hmm. in that house there. Um, and then after that, after that, we moved to an upper middle class neighborhood now. Um, and then... After my, after my father passed away, my mother moved us into now a, a more upper class in the hills with a big house and a, lots of rooms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was the movement. And um, <clears throat> for me, it was fun. As a child, as a child, we, I don't have any growing up looking back now. Everything was just, everything was a great learning experience. You know, this life with my family, my father, my mother, and, and what they were going through, I was also learning from at the same time. Yeah. What's it like going back to Jamaica now? You must get, it's like you must get mobbed walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't been back in a while still, but going back, when I went back last time, Jamaica, I mean, a lot, a lot has changed. Yeah. A lot of, another generation, a lot of the vibes has changed. The outlook has changed. You know, I'm, I'm a lot of more Americanization of, of Jamaica. Um, and so, but the countryside is where the magic still remains. Mm -hmm. You know, the city, the, the, the city side, I'm not so, I'm not, it's not a, cause when we, when we was growing up in a city, it wasn't like a, met, a big metropolitan city. It was like a little town and it was still had that vibe of like, you know, you're still in Jamaica, but now it kind of, the city kind of get a little more hectic. Mm -hmm. And so, but the countryside is, is still where it's Jamaica has a vibe to it. Um, that, you don't really get anywhere else for me, you know. Um, it's a very inspirational place. Um, if you find the right spot, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, the uh, go, go back to the book for a moment. Well, no, 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 Jim, oh. uh, Ian, tell me something. Ian Fleming, he wrote his his James Bond stuff in Jamaica, no? Golden Eye. Well, Golden I think Eye. Golden Eye yeah. is written in Jamaica. Golden some, Eye near San Antonio, near Port Antonio. Is, I think okay. there's a. There was a there was a, a resort or a, a house he stayed at. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I was a plenty sure. inspiration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there. Well, it's funny. We were um, I we have been doing this project with uh, Paul Simon, and he was one of many who came down to Jamaica in the seventies to record 
Um, mm-hmm. uh, I've forgotten. Uh, what's the reggae song he does? It's actually a lovely reggae song. Um, you know, again. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mother and Child Reunion. Eh? Mother and Child Reunion. Mother and Child Reunion. Yes, right, that's right. right, right, right. And right. he was, and he went, he goes because he says, he tries to get American session players in, you know, some R&B place to mm-hmm. do reggae and they can't do it. And he's like, so gets so frustrated. And he realizes it's this, he has this insight, which he always has to go to the place where they're speaking their own language, right? Yeah. You can't ever, it's why he goes to South Africa. It's yeah. why he goes to yeah, all these, yeah, yeah, yeah. all these places. But, and Keith Richard, of course, Keith Richards was, was, was the mm-hmm. Rolling Stones were coming in. Yeah, no, it's a, a, uh, um, <clears throat> it's easy to see why Jamaicans have such a, an inflated sense of their own importance because <laughs> yeah. the whole world comes running very to us. Proud, very proud. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, um, the, I want to talk about some of the photographs that mean the most to you in this book. Um, mm. my, my first question was, by the way, was how many of these photographs did you take or other family members take and how many of them are professional photographs? Well, um, we, I didn't take, we never take any. These aren't our photographs. These are yeah. um, professional. There's, there's his friend Neville who used to do his lighting and design his album art, have a, some photos in there. Um, but with the book, what we what I try to do is um, do a balance of those type of professional, like iconic images and with more like images of, you know, just in real life outside of the, 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 the musician, outside of the stage. You know, show some back, you know, show him beyond that. And for try and, as I said in the book, try and make people even feel a deeper relationship to him. Because if you know someone just as your icon or as your, as a, as a musician or, a, a, I mean, a singer, then that's one way of doing it. But if you can get a deeper understanding of his, of his life during that same period of time beyond that, then you can feel even more connected to the person on, on, on that level. So that's what I was trying to do with the book, you know, but um, we never, unfortunately, we, at the time, we never really do a lot of, you know, we never have cameras. And we never have no camera. We never have no camera. Yeah. You know what I say? Photographers have cameras. We don't have cameras. <laughs> Musicians. So, you know? Do you, were, were, was the process of going through all these photographs painful? Must have brought back all kinds of memories. Yeah, no, but joyful, not painful. I mean, melancholy because Bob is not here. Mm-hmm. And when you look at the photograph, you say, oh, what a young man. I'm 50, I'm 52 now. So when I look at him, he's like, look at this young guy, little young kid. You know what I mean? Why? You know, it's, so that is a sad thing. Um, but there's so much, the joy overweigh that. There's mm-hmm. so much joy. I'm um, just looking at him and, and, and um, seeing him in that way where I know he was having a good time while he was doing it too. You know, he mm-hmm. wasn't upset. He, he was having a good time. He enjoyed he enjoyed his experience, you know. What I say so. I feel happy about that. I get, I know he was having a good time doing it, you know. Do you have a Do you have a favorite photograph in this book? Because we're going to show photographs on the screen, I think. So I have I'd a love favorite to know. photograph. I don't have a favorite photograph. No. Yeah. yeah. I love some of these. There's you, some of these group shots. Like? There's There's on page fifty. There's this fantastic group shot. Of, oh, um, do you know this one I'm talking about? The one, the soccer one or what? The first one. Oh, the band, with the band. The band, yeah, the band photo. Okay. It's a, All right, it's... So this photo now was taken in, in, in England. I was here, I was there. Oh, really? We were either on the way to Zimbabwe or coming from Zimbabwe. That's why the next photo of me, if, if you look at the next photo, this is England too. So this is this is the time period where they're... Um, Right before Zimbabwe or after Zimbabwe, we yeah. were in England, and I had went on the trip with him. And you know, yeah, football as usual. I was going to say that. The, were you guys just that second photograph? Were you? You were all just playing a game, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were all just playing a game. But yeah, you see, this is it. This is Bob with the band and Bob with the team, you know. And so, that, yeah. And that's they belong. His, they belong together. His two. Yeah. His two great obsessions. Yeah, yeah. I had not realized the extent to which he was a soccer. I was going through the book and seeing all these photographs of him playing. First of all, I know you're his son, but I want you to be honest. How good was he? He was good. I mean, I remember he played against me when I was in um, 
you know, sometimes our parents versus, I, I was on the soccer team in elementary school. And I remember he came, there was parents versus, you know, students. And, you know, so he came and I was like, yeah, I'll mark this guy. I'll mark this. I'll, I have this guy. I'll take him. <laughs> no, but Bob, um, he was fast, which is good. Yeah. And he had a good kick. And um, he was a good player. He was a good player, man. Because he, he idolized soccer player. One of his good friends was Alan Skillcole, who was like the top Jamaican player at the time. And they were good friends. So, I mean, he kept fit. He kept... His workout was like a, a professional soccer player workout. Yeah. You know, abdominals, you know, running on the sand, playing soccer. Like that was that was a that was a workout. It's a soccer player workout, basically. And his friends, all of his friends were soccer players or could play soccer. Yeah. You know, so he was drawn towards you know, people like that, you know. But Ziggy, to be a fan of Jama of Jamaican soccer is it exercise in masochism it's like the i know this from my cousins nothing is more painful than this team that just loses and loses and loses <laughs> no but the funny thing is that we have some of the best players in the world but i don't know because <laughs> we, we are i think we had some great players you know um but yeah i don't know i think we need a better structure a better um you know a better way what you call it um well yeah no the all of the, the the small countries that thrive have. Hey, hey but hold on, we have the best. Hold on, but we have the best runner. Well, you always have, have the best fastest runner. runner, though. Yeah, that's <laughs> all, but that's been true forever. We're talking about. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, so, do you, you, you're, was your I, I, I had mentioned him before. Um, to, when I think of Jamaica in the seventies, I think of your dad and I think of Donald Quarry. The great Donald Quarry and um, Merlin Nati. I'm really naughty, but yeah. Donald, you don't. You did you ever meet him? By the way, he must have been around. No, no, I mean, I know when I went to play at the stadium, his statue was right outside the stadium. Every time we'd pass yeah. the Quarry statue. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. I meet him? I feel like I met him, but the memory isn't. You know, he's living. Sure. In, I'm almost certain he was from. He was living in Kingston in the seventies. Or I've is, seen him. I've I've seen him around or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, tell me, pick another photo and, and, t and talk to me about it. That that means something to you. And while you're doing that, I, I will tell the those listening who don't know who Don, Donald Corey is. Donald Corey was the was the world record holder in the 200 meters and the Olympic champion, gold medalist and an iconic Jamaican figure. The uh, he was the he was the Usain Bolt of his day. Mm -hmm. Let's see what I can pull up here. There's wonderful photos of that of that of the One Love concert with Siega and 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 Michael Manley. Yeah, those are really. Uh, yeah, too. we were, I remember that. I was there. Me and my brother went on stage. Cause that's what we usually do. Like me and Stephen, my brother Stephen. Uh -huh. um, you would go on stage, we would go on stage uh, in that last song, which is usually Exodus. So, I mean, those times was tough too. The, the One Love Peace concert. Um, man, getting there with... Hey. So, I remember... Let me, let me, I don't think we have any photos at that period. But when Bob, after the assassination attempt, and Bob had come home for the One Love Peace concert, so we all went to the airport and... You know, there was thousands of people at the airport because now Bob was coming back. And the thing is that the two political, we talked about them earlier, the two political um, strongmen for the parties, political parties now, were on the same page as Bob. And so everyone that support these political parties now was supporting Bob and, and, and these, these guys who now have their own ideas of peace and less political violence. So the airport was full, and then I was there, and I remember the crowd and them pulled Bob, and I'm I'm there, I'm outside now, in this crowd, all mixed up with everybody, and Bob get pulled into a car, and I'm by the window like this, I'm Bob, I'm Bob, Bob does Bob why no and he pulled me through the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, you knew you got left behind. <laughs> <laughs> I got mixed up in the crowd. It was like just crowd. No, and there was no. I had no nanny or nobody watching me. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, just we touched on this earlier. It's important to remember in this moment in Jamaican history, the this. It's almost like the country is in is in a state of civil war. Yeah, I mean, it's the. It is. 
it is there is violence everywhere. There is, you know, the, the people are leaving Jamaica in droves to come to the United States or Canada to escape. It's a kind of a crazy, um, yeah, a yeah, crazy yeah. period. But it's funny. Not only a, a civil war is like a geopolitical war going on at the same time between um, the United States and Russia and Cuba because that was the whole mm -hmm. thing. That's why, um, you know, I mean, one of the political Edward Siaga, he was a Boston, he graduated from Boston University or whatever it was. And so there was the geopolitical situation even elevated the stakes even more. Yeah. And Bob, I mean, Bob was in a serious position. and he, Nobody knew, but he was in a, posi a serious position because of the geopolitical element. Um, would, would America allow a socialist government who has ties with Cuba to have another, which, which would then mean Russia having a, a, a more influence in that region. You know, America didn't want that and would not allow that. Yeah. And now yeah. there was this guy, this singer guy who, who people were drawn to and he was like, he had some political power too because the, the political um, strongmen and their people were now drawn to this singer guy. Who, who's this singer guy? You know what I'm saying? So. The stakes were really high beyond what I think we realized, or even Bob might have realized at the time, mm -hmm. or people around him, you know. Um, so let's, there's a photo. Let, we want to talk about the photo. Let's go to um, which pages? Some of these things don't have numbers on them. Let me tell you. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. Try 90, page 97 if you can count from. It's him, uh -huh. it's him like at his home, in his home, at, in the countryside after 92. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yes. So this guy, I, I used to, we used to go to the country with him. We, this is St. Anne. We used to go back with him uh -huh. because, you know, um, on a trip. And this, this is just the real Bob. You know what I mean? I said, this is, and these are the people. This is where Bob come from. These are his mm -hmm. people. This is his roots. He, he was born on this land. And I mean, you can see the, the guy, he's, he's coming to, he's either coming from the field or going to the field. He might have some probably yam and stuff in that crocus bag you have there. And everybody, I mean, Bob was just one of the people. He was just one of them. Mm. And as you can see, he's, and he's talking, he's eating a banana and talking to some of the kids them, you know, and some of them have shoes on, some don't have shoes on and they're laughing. So Bob... <laughs> Well, you know, in, in communication with people, good communication skills, you know, with people and, you know, yeah, and just having yeah. fun. He was enjoying life. He's yeah. sitting on, he's sitting on the stairs here on the next page over. That in, pic you know, that yeah. picture is, is, I mean, he's so, you can just tell how relaxed and at home he is. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. But at the time yeah. this photo was taken, he is very, when is this? Is this mid seventies? He's at the height, he's at the height of yeah, his man. fame. Yeah, man. Him, him, yeah, man. Yeah. After the assassination attempt. So this is, yeah, he's at the height right here. Yeah, yeah. And this is, is a... as you see, this he's leaning on the other page, he's leaning up on the VW van. This is, so we had, my mother had a Beetle and he we he would drive this VW van. I think this those are the, the only two kinds of cars there were in Jamaica in those years. <laughs> <laughs> VW vans and, and VW Beetles. <laughs> so yeah, and uh, yeah. Some of these people, some of them is his cousins too. There's yeah. a couple of cousins in here. Yeah, yeah. So this is at home. And then this is the last photo from that series, I think. Um, if you go to the next page, it's him sitting down, still in St. Anne's. But he's alone, his guitar is on the floor here, on, on the ground right here. And he's um mm -hmm. he's barefoot also right there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this photo now is like, this is Bob. I think Bob was always like a loner and he always felt alone, although he had so many people around him. This is Bob. Um, this is him in his like, this is his meditation. This is him like in his space, you know what I'm saying? Alone and just vibing. Um, but I felt, I felt like he felt like he was always alone um, yeah. in some way, you know, and this kind of represent that loneliness in a way. Yeah. Yeah. What, one last um, uh, set of questions has been where, um, we're coming to a close here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your own music. Um, mm -hmm. And 
you must have thought about you were you had this extraordinary gift, which is the gift of your father and his legacy, and then, <clears throat> but it also presents a a challenge to kind of carve out your own identity in that. How have you how have you approached that? Yeah, when I go back and look at my history, right, or the family history, so we have musicians and artists on both sides of my family. A lot of people always talk about my father's legacy. My mother is, was also key in in um, in everything. My mother was actually key in Bob's success. Without my mother, Bob wouldn't be as successful. I wouldn't even have what he has. She was the one who reintroduced him or introduced him to the Rastafarian culture, which had a big um, um, impact on him mentally and spiritually. Um, she was with him. Uh, she's the one who, when they didn't have nothing, she's the one who gave him somewhere to sleep. Um, and she was the one who slept on the floor with him in the studios, who sold records with him um, on their head, riding their bicycles through the, through the streets. Um, she was the one who got shot in her head, same time he got shot in the hand and still showed up for the concert when other people were like, no, we're not going. She still had a bullet in her head. So her impact on his legacy and, and where we are is, I always remember that too. You know, when I think about my, um, what you just asked me about, you know, making my own way or whatever. I remember that what I have is not just coming from my father, it's coming from my, fa my mother. Her grandfather, her father, my grandfather was a saxophone player. My father, mother, and his family were all church people, singers. They sing in churches. And so the spirit, there's, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's both sides. And for me, yes, I understand the question of my father and his, um, his weight or his, his impact and what it would mean to someone like me or a son of any person like Bob. And, and how we kind of, who are we who choose to be in the same line of work kind of have to overcome whatever that thing is. Um, so for me, never really was on the forefront of my mind. Um, I, and it was on the peripherals. And I, and I heard it, I heard them thing and I heard it, but I never paid much attention to it. Mm -hmm. It was, it's, it, I never, I started seeking a spiritual path when I was a teenager. So my whole mental state was evolved beyond that because I was looking. And it's because of my father I was looking. You know, because of his spirituality led me to search for my spirituality. And so for me, I was way past my ego of trying or, or thinking about or putting that pressure on myself to live up to the legacy or to make my own name or make my own way. I don't need to make my own way. I just need to be myself. That will that will solve all the problem. That will solve the problem that people is asking the question about. I don't need to like try to do it. Mm -hmm. I just need to be true. And then that that is what that is how it really is. And I also need to accept and I do accept that my father is a part of me. There's gonna be similarities. There's gonna be things that is like, you know, it's like Bob, you know what I mean? So we're not trying to dis, dis, um, distance ourselves from him in that way either. So there's no, that struggle doesn't exist because I don't want to distance ourselves from him because I am a part of him anyway. You cannot do that. You, you, he has a song called you're running away. You're running away, but you can't run away from yourself. You know what I'm saying? So that is how I, that is how I really um, try. That is how I, I sim when I analyze it myself, after being asked that question, that is how I see myself ha having dealt with it in that way, you know? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's beautifully put, yeah. Um, well, thank you, Ziggy. I think I think we, we have some questions, Ted, is that right? Um, but this is, um, I re the, like I said, the, bo the book was so lovely and took me back um, yeah. to so many kind of wonderful memories of that era and, of that era in Jamaica, and um, uh, and it's a it's an, a real thrill to talk to you about it. Um, I totally understand that, bro. Me yeah. too. Same thing. All right. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. The first question, uh, Ziggy, is: um, Have you been to Ethiopia? And can you say something about your connection and your father's connection to Ethiopia? 
Yeah, we were in Ethiopia years back to celebrate. I think it was the 60th or one of those birthdays of Bob because um, obviously yeah, Ethiopia and um, its history, we found a strong connection to through um, the Rastafari culture. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty, it's a deep story um, because, and I, I probably, yeah, let me cut it short. So, Coming in, coming, living in Jamaica during the times of after independence, or you know, what is it, post slavery, or whatever. The Christian faith and the faith that was um, forced upon us by the colonists um, was something that a sector of you know Jamaicans started to turn against. Like you know, this is a slave master thing, you know. Why God? Why Jesus is a white guy with blue eyes? Blah blah blah. Where is our? Who do we identify with? And so, Marcus Garvey really started a whole conversation on this and and said some stuff. You know, when Marcus was talking about black thing and the black one and you know your black identity, that was a strong inspiration. And then when Rastafari start using the same Bible that was given to them by the colonists to now interpret it in a way that put an emphasis on this king in Ethiopia as the re as the coming of another Christ-like individual. And in that in that um philosophy, in that in that idea, a lot of people in Jamaica found a, a real independence, a full break from the colonialist, not only the political independence, but the mental independence. And that was the rise of the Rastafari culture and the connection with Ethiopia, with this king who within the Bible is still represented because he is a lineage of King Solomon. And in the Bible, it says he will come again with the name King of Kings, Lord of Lords, conquering on a tribe of Judah. And this was the title that this man, has, this man has. And so that strong connection to Ethiopia is forged through that because Exodus, you know, Bob had an album called Exodus, and Exodus obviously is a relation to the, the struggle of is, the Israel people coming out of Egypt. And so we had a strong connection with that whole thing with David and Solomon. And um, so Rastafari come through that connection with Elis Lassie I as a descendant of Solomon. And so Ethiopia, yeah, Ethiopia was a big, Ethiopia was like our um, Jerusalem or Mecca or whatever, that, you know, yeah, that was, Ethiopia was like that for, for the Rastafari culture. Next question, uh, Ziggy, you have lived um, in lots of places and you and Malcolm have talked about some of this. What is your notion of home? What does home mean to you? Is it, how much of it is a physical place or a sense of being or a sense of mind? Yeah, my father answered the question to you know home. I think it's like he says in my mind, and I agree with him. I find that I find that to be true for me also. That yeah, I'm not like home is anywhere. Home is anywhere I want. I want to be home is anywhere I am. I, I can you know it's home. Home, my yeah, I am home. This this is home. My, my house is my body. I live in here, you know, and my eyes are the windows, you know. <laughs> And I look, I look out, you know, look out on the world through the eyes, you know. <laughs> so that's how I see it, really. And yeah, yeah, you know, I am home, you know. So your siblings um, have uh, crafted their own music careers. Um, the questioner asks, what is the relationship between your siblings, both musically and, and how do you relate to each other today? So we grew up, all right, so we grew up, this come back how we grew now, because it's very important, because all right, my, my father was married to my mother, but he had ch children out of wedlock, right? Because obviously, <laughs> the wedlock thing is a colonial thing, and we don't deal with colonial things, you know, we are free or whatever. <laughs> so that was my father's, you know, philosophy. After you learn things, then you just free yourself. Anyway, but so we always grew up, you know, when, like my father would take us to visit, like I'm the oldest son, right? So he would take me and sometimes my brother Stephen. You know, there was a new there was a new baby or a new, you know, he would drive us to the, the house where the where my brother my other brother was. 
who was not of my mother. And you know, he would visit and we would meet, meet you know, Kimani or meet Robbie or meet Rowan or whoever it was. And my mother now, which is the most important part of this, was always, she was like the mother of all of them. Like she was the mother of the children who she wasn't the mother of, basically. So everybody would come to us and, you know, my mother would be the one who kind of take care of Bob children, whether it was his child or not. And she is the one who never, she never taught us to like be like vindictive or hateful or resentful of my father or of the other children in no way. We were just one family. You know what I say? So that's how we, that's the lesson we have learned. Nobody, nobody taught us that, oh, you shouldn't like that guy because he's not your mother's son. You know, or he, you know, it's, you know we never learned that. So that's how we still are today. Um, and um, we um, we get together every now and again, but we have a, such a strong connection that you know we don't we don't really feel like we we don't really have that emotional like sadness of not you know we you know yeah we kind of we kind of emotionally um, tough you know tougher our way our even a better way to say emotionally um, what what you call that again. We don't have that emotion, that deep emotional sadness or like, oh, I miss my thing or oh, my brother or something like that. You know, we, we never grew up that way. We grew up a little bit less emotional, I would say. So we don't have that in us. But we do have a connection um, and a love for each other and a respect for each other. And and a, a thing where we never, we never, we never fight each other. We never, you know, we understand each other and, and everybody understand each other. So that's how we live. Musically, um, me and my brother Stephen, we share a lot of music. Damien, Steve is the one who nurtured Damien. We nurture each other music, basically. Each, each of us. I, I, I helped Steve when he was young. Steve helped his younger brother, and it just, we just keep nurturing each other. So that's how it is. I hope that explains some of it. <laughs> Uh, final question has to do, and there were several people who asked questions about musical collaborations. Um, is there anyone you would have liked to see your father have collaborated with that he did not get to? And how do you feel about musical collaborations? Who would you like to collaborate with? No, oh, musical collaborations are a good thing, right? We, we, in some ways, it is expanding each of the artists' um reach to other audiences which is good it is showing a, a true example of um unification in a way where it can be two different types of music blending together to to bring to make something new um so collaboration is a good thing um i i've done a few collaborations since it's funny I, you i don't really i'm not I'm a very shy person, so I don't like to ask people for things. I don't really like to ask people, you know, like, hey, can you do this? For me? Okay. You know, so I'm very shy like that. But for some reason this year, um, during the COVID thing, I've, I've done the most collaborations I've ever done in 10 years, which is very strange. It's a, it's a very interesting time for me. Um, and how those come about? Well, the first collaborations I've, I did last year was... Um, from a kid's album. Um, and I think when I do children's music, I find it's a diff I have a different state of mind than when I do, when I do the other type, the, my other music. Children's music, I'm much more like, yo, let's ask, you know, Ben, hey Ben, you know, I'm like, I don't know, somehow I feel more, um, more comfortable with asking somebody to do something for children music and it has something to do with that we have a charitable element to it. Um, and so I'm much more comfortable doing that. So I did a, I did a few big collaborations with um, Ben Harper, Cheryl Crow, Alanis Morissette, Angelique Kijo. Um, who else we do it with? My name is uh, Tom Morello, Buster Rhymes. So my kids album have a, like a bag of collaboration, which we really enjoy doing. And how I work with collaboration is that we have to have a connection. It can't just be like, a, a corporate deal. It can be like a, 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 a you know, just have a contractual relationship. We, it has to be something real. 
and that is why I've, I haven't done a lot of collaboration but all of these artists that are on that album i've done for years we've done music together you know we we talk and we take or whatever so that's how i like to do collaborations never as a never as a gimmick or just as a um, a commercial endeavor it must always be something that is felt that i feel is real and we have a connection um for bob um i can't speculate on that i do i don't want to speculate on that um bob you know he was in a collaborative band the whalers he collaborated pete and bunny and i know um steve won that joined them on stage recently not recently but i i spoke to steve recently that's what i said recently but steve joined bob on stage so i think the collaborate and there was also um what's his name came back stage what's the beatles guy name george harrison so i feel like um bob collaboration collaborational spirit was one where if he was on stage and somebody wanted to come up, he would welcome them up. Call up. He's a he's a social person. Come on up and sing. I, I don't, I'm not sure about recording. Um, I don't know about that. And I, there's no way. I, I can't even imagine it. I can't even speculate on that. So, yeah. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, Ziggy Marley. Uh, thank you, Malcolm Gladwell, for chatting with Ziggy. A reminder again, uh, Ziggy Marley's book is Bob Marley, Portrait of the Legend. And a reminder, the book is available for purchase wherever books are sold.